right. Well, I will um, echo Carrie's warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to the Valencia College Sustainability Conference. I'm Dr. Lisa Macon. Um, I've done a lot of things at Valencia. I'm currently the program chair for the Bachelor of Applied Science program in computing technology and software development. And I've been um, active in sustainability for about a decade, um, uh, mainly when I got my first electric car. Uh, <laughs> It made me see things in a whole different way. Um, and I'm really excited. Our program students for their senior project have been partnering with the city of Orlando for a few semesters now and have been doing some really great work there. Um, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's session. Uh, the Valencia College Office of Sustainability is turning 10 years old and is celebrating by hosting this free virtual conference for Valencia students, faculty, staff, and the community conference runs from uh, October 12th through the 14th and addresses topics ranging from sustainability in our community and in higher education to environmental justice and sustainability perspectives from public policy, science, and technology. As Carrie mentioned, we'll be recording this uh, session. The recordings will be made available after the conference. If you, oh, if you are a Valencia student, uh, for each session you attend, you'll be entered into a drawing for prizes at the end of the conference, including stasher bags, portable solar chargers, or even an iPad. The more sessions you attend, the greater your chance of winning, and you must be actively enrolled as a Valencia student in order to win. What is sustainability? When we say sustainability, what do we mean? The common definition for environmental sustainability is from the Brundtland uh, Commission to the, to the United Nations in 1987, describing it as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Throughout this conference, we will be looking at sustainability and what it means to live and work using our finite natural resources responsibly in order that they will be around for future generations to do the same. All right, um, what does the Office of Sustainability do? At Valencia, the Office of Sustainability's mission is to promote and execute operational practices in the service of environmental, economic and social responsibility for current and future generations, which effectively, while effectively communicating and educating about the significance of these practices for people on the planet. Our vision, to serve as a sustainability role model in our community. One way to summarize all of this is with the triple bottom line, which emphasizes measuring success in three areas, environmental, economic, and social responsibility, or said in another way, it's a little easier to remember the three Ps, people, planet, and prosperity. Our sustainability office focuses on the operations of the college. This goes into many areas, including all of those that you see here on this slide. And in other sessions, uh, you have been able to and will be able to learn more about what Valencia is doing in waste and recycling, energy, water conservation, transportation, grounds, and food. We're proud to be here today putting on this virtual conference to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of the establishment of the Office of Sustainability. It was created in the fall of 2011 with the hiring of the first sustainability director, Dr. Deborah Green, an environmental science faculty member at Valencia. Over the years, Valencia has accomplished many things within sustainability, having gone from one green certified building to 12, improved and expanded recycling college-wide, including winning recycling competitions, as well as increased energy efficiency, saving millions of dollars through both mechanical and behavior changes, just to name a few. None of this was accomplished without the support of our students, faculty, and staff. Thank you to each and every one who's been involved in sustainability, whether it was 10 years ago or some time along our journey to today. Thank you. What's in store for sustainability and for the next 10 years and beyond? Our three primary objectives are obtain carbon neutrality by 2050, reduce the waste of, that the college generates and improve water conservation and stormwater management. Our largest goal is carbon neutrality and it encompasses energy efficiency and conservation, renewables and addressing our transportation related emissions. In order to be successful and accomplish these goals, we need all of your help. There are numerous ways to get involved. You can join a student club or get connected with SGA and the SGA sustainability officer at your campus. Also, there are opportunities for food waste champions to assist with our food waste recycling education at our East and West campuses. You can join our Tree Campus Higher Education Committee, helping provide input to our tree care and plantings. Keep up to date with ways to get involved in upcoming events by following us on social media. And to find out more about these opportunities, please email the address you see at the bottom of your screen. 
sometimes my PowerPoint gets a little laggy. Okay. Um, as we are now going to head into our session presentation, I want to introduce our two wonderful guest speakers for today, starting with Chris Castro. Uh, Chris, if you want to wave. <laughs> I can't see you right now. Oh, there you are. Okay. Chris is a sustainability consultant, clean energy professional, and eco entrepreneur with a passion to co-create urban solutions that advance smart, resilient, and sustainable cities, cities in balance with nature. Since 2014, Chris has worked at the city of Orlando as the senior advisor to Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer, director of sustainability and resilience, and future ready steering committee member developing a comprehensive set of policies and programs that advance the city's sustainability, climate action, and smart city goals. Chris is best known for his entrepreneurial efforts prior to coming to the city, including co-founder and president of Ideas for Us, a global UN accredited 501c3 nonprofit working to incubate and fund innovative projects that advance the UN sustainable development goals. In 2012, Chris also started a clean energy consulting and development firm called Citizen Energy that operates in Washington, DC. And in 2013, co-created Fleet Farming, a renowned urban farming social enterprise program that's redefining local food systems by building organic farms on homeowner lawns, schools, and underutilized land throughout neighborhoods and communities. Outside of work, Chris sits on nearly a dozen nonprofit and academic boards, including the Florida Solar Energy Center, U.S. Green Building Council of Florida, Project Green Schools, and Goodwill Industries of Central Florida. He's previously held sustainability positions with University of Central Florida, Orange County Government, and the U.S. Department of Energy. Over the years, Chris has been internationally recognized for his efforts, including being named the 2018 Public Official of the Year by Governing, a Champions of Change by Pro President Barack Obama and Guru of Green by the Orlando Business Journal, the Grist 50 Fixer Award, the Top 30 Under 30 Sustainability Professionals by Green Biz, and formal recognition from President Bill Clinton, President Jimmy Carter, and Vice President Al Gore. And we're so excited to have him here with us today. Thank you, Lisa. I would also mention that I'm a proud Valencia College EMCT member, so I love the work that we've been able to do on that, and I'll, I'll, I'll share more insights soon. Awesome. I mean, we could have gone on about what you've done for Valencia all day, but hopefully you'll get to talk about, you'll talk to us about some of that. All right, and um, last but not least, our other guest speaker for this session is Jeff Benavides, and uh, Jeff serves as Chief Sustainability and Resilience Officer of Orange County after having served in similar positions at several companies, working on the city of Orlando's sustainability efforts and teaching energy management sustainability right here at Valencia College. Jeff comes to or Orange County from LE Rigby Innovations, where he was principal founding partner and director of sustainability and from Echo Preserve, where he was senior quality assurance and energy manager. He also helped create more than $5 million in energy and water savings as energy and sustainability manager for Wyndham Hotels and Resorts, according to the county's news release. Jeff is an adjunct professor at Valencia College's Energy Management Controls Technology Program and serves on the board for the U.S. Green Building Council of Central Florida, ASHRAE Central Florida, and the National Solar Workforce Development Committee. He is a published sustainability author and columnist and a graduate of University of Central Florida and the International Society of Sustainability Professionals Certificate Program. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Jeff. And I believe Jeff is going to get us started. So I will stop my share and, uh, and hand it over to Jeff. Awesome, thank you so much, Lisa. And good morning, almost good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be here. Uh, happy to, you know, thank you to Carrie and Lisa, both and anyone else behind the scenes that put this event on together. Hope you guys have been able to take advantage over the last three, uh, over the, this last week. And please keep advantage as my, um, my, my, my one ask of you all is to remain uh, engaged and take advantage of a lot of the resources that we're going to share here today and reach out to Carrie as well as Lisa on how you can continue engaging on campus. So as Lisa mentioned, uh, I'll, we'll go ahead and start out by kind of the Orange County and the city of Orlando. So of course our mission here today is to kind of educate you on uh, our local governments here in Orlando area. 
for those of you that have been living here for uh, quite a while or live in and around the area, Orlando's very changing and sprawling place. Um, so we'll do a little bit civic lesson and then dive into some of the uh, incentives or in initiatives that we have going on in uh, Central Florida. So with that, let me go ahead and share this. If I can get this going. All right. So uh, just a, again, a little bit about me. I do, uh, the only thing I wanted to add is I'm a proud member of the adjunct uh, professor team there at Valencia College, specifically at the West Campus. They teach uh, two courses at the moment uh, in our College of Engineering. Uh, specifically under energy management controls technology, which is an automation workforce uh, degree that prepares for the building technicians and automation technicians to run the smart city of the future, which uh, you'll learn more about where we're going. And that's essentially why we created this program um, as, a, as a community uh, that, that saw the, the foresight of all the workforce that we would need to build this community of tomorrow. So just for some context and civic lesson here for all of you, I always like to throw this up just as a reminder, Orange County is a big place. We've got about a thousand square miles of land uh, in our county. We're just one of 67 counties here in Florida. And there are currently 13 cities and towns within Orange County. So a lot of people think uh, they have an identity crisis here because your address might say Orlando, Florida but you're actually in unincorporated Orange County. Um, so you can see the, the different areas of the colors are where the city boundaries are. And you'll see all of the white areas are where what we consider unincorporated Orange County. And uh, I say that just because Orange County is a unique place, just because we have a lot of counties have a very diverse uh, services, but we as an urban county here in the Orlando area, we provide a lot of services directly to people as we do uh, a city directly. So again, just for context and geographical, we are here uh, for everyone. Um, it, as I mentioned before, we are growing uh, at a staggering uh, rate. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has not uh, missed a beat as far as growth here in the Orlando area, uh, fortunately, but unfortunately as well, we have uh, about, uh, our expectation uh, is that we're gonna have about 690,000 additional people here by the year 2050, which is pretty incredible when you start to think about it. And of course, this these numbers were kind of pre-pandemic numbers and pre-economic uh, issues numbers. So we're expecting even higher um, and not even accounting for the threats of climate change or climate migration yet with these numbers. So a lot of change that we're going to occur. And uh, we always like to use this ratio, ratio of one resident to every 62 tourists that visit us each year. Not only are we having this population growth for people that live here full time, but our tourism industry, you know, we, before the pandemic, we hit 72 million tourists uh, that year, which was the highest in record. So uh, over the New York City, over Paris, over Tokyo, I mean, we have a lot of activity. And of course, all of those things with, with growth and with economic development comes a lot of stress uh, on our system. And we have a lot of vulnerabilities, shocks and stressors that we are really accounting for and trying to keep mindful between the work that all of us are doing at the regional scale. So I won't bore you with so, so much more of those uh, higher level infrastructure, transportation, housing, we all know those, uh, but water, air quality, and food systems are all equally as important. So just for some context for Orange County, I'll go ahead and dive in for kind of what we do at the county and, uh, and how you all partake in our services. Um, we have of the, of the 1.4 million people that currently live in the Orla greater Orlando area uh, within Orange County, um, we service directly about 800,000 residents directly. So those are what we call our direct residents. And um, we have quite a lot of infrastructure that we service out there. Hopefully you all have been able to go out to our uh, parks and uh, the convention center. We have a correctional facility. Uh, we have three regional water facilities, nine water supply facilities. 
Uh, we have enough water mains, fun fact, to get from here to Las Vegas, which is uh, pretty incredible when you start thinking about the amount of infrastructure that we have out there. Um, and also notably, we uh, run a landfill. Uh, this landfill, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, um, is uh, out on the east side of town um, over by Avalon Park. And we also operate two transfer stations here. So uh, for today, uh, Chris and I are gonna uh, divvy up just so that we're kind of hitting these major pillars of sustainability and resilience. And I'm talking about water use, quality, materials, and some of our natural green space. And then Chris is gonna dive into some more uh, building energy efficiencies, uh, construction, as well as climate change uh, and climate impacts. So uh, over, over the course of our county, we, we have about uh, different uh, utilities that service clean water for irrigation as well as for drinking water, over nine separate water utilities that all deliver different services. So again, not everyone's created equal depending on where you live and all those services rely on back to the utilities that uh, function. For Orange County Utilities, which services uh, about a little under uh, 900,000 people uh, here in Orange County, we have quite a bit of scope uh, with regards to delivering that clean, healthy water for you all and constantly working across now county lines to with other counties to continue development of new water supply, protecting our aquifer and maintaining conservation and efficiency with all of our uh, permits that we have here. Aside from drinking water, we also have if you look at Orange County on a map, obviously you can see all the Swiss cheese and lakes everywhere. All those lakes are managed um, in some way or another, they're managed and maintained. Um, we test for water quality, test for drinking water quality, and also all of our retention ponds that we have throughout the county that manage our stormwater system. So we have quite a bit of scope when it comes to uh, water management. And a, a key need for us is uh, workforce. We have, uh, I'd say about 200 vacancies right now in, in, in and around the environmental, public works, water management uh, focus areas across our county alone. So a uh, very good source of uh, entry level um, that we have a lot of great entry level opportunities for student interns, as well as for students that are graduating um, at any level to get involved, uh, do water quality sciences, field services, testing, get dirty down in the slogs and have some fun uh, with a lot of the services that we provide out there for the region, not just for our county and uh, our jurisdiction, but a lot of the cities that we provide water quality and testing for as well. So uh, just a, a quick, uh, overview on some of the initiatives that we have going that we're really like changing uh, the way that we're doing things. We've got a whole standard, uh, a new set of design and construction projects, principles that we have now put into all of our standard manuals, specification manuals. And um, what this will do is that we're taking typical sustainability criteria for green building, high performance, lower environmental impact, and really trying to look at all of our projects that we do massive roadway projects and so on. How do we design and build better? Um, for those of you that are interested in kind of civil engineering and construction, uh, I would encourage you to check out the Envision rating system. That's called the Envision, E-N-V-I-S-I-O-N rating system, as well as the LEED system, which has an entire section for sustainable site development, which is also really cool. Uh, to think about and look into if you're interested in that type of work. Um, also, this idea of uh, nature-based resilience and green infrastructure is something new that is coming to the state that other states have been really successful in implementing. And the only ones here in Florida that have been very successful that I would call successful have been uh, West Florida. So Southwest Florida have been very intentional about green infrastructure. And what this means is using nature to manage and do what it needs to do. Uh, because of growth, we've decided to build our uh, solutions and you know, make that man-made solutions like a stormwater pond. Uh, but now we're looking to going back to the way nature is intended to do 
utilizing trees, utilizing green space, utilizing different water bodies to mitigate some of these um, uh, civil and structural things that we need to do out there to manage water across um, town. So uh, just a quick project highlight for those, any, uh, hope some of you may live out on the west side of town. We just opened up a water reclamation facility, uh, which now adds to uh, five water reclamation facilities that we have. And what we do with these water reclamation, reclamation facilities are we actually take water that you all are using and flushing down the toilet or brushing your teeth with. We clean it, we refine it through a very, very intricate and very expensive process and then put it back into the system to go into drinking water or go into reclaim water for uh, irrigation um, or other types of process use. So our reclamation facilities are massive and very uh, cool line of work if you're interested in water and engineering and construction. Uh, our new facility out there does about 5 million gallons per day that serves a lot of the new uh, construction over there that's happening. One of the other things that the city and county do uh, from a water side is you'll, you'll see in this bottom right hand corner these like square shaped sand ponds or sandboxes looks like. Those are what we called aquifer recharge areas. So any water that we don't put back into the system, we actually put it back into the ground so that we can then come back and extract it later on. So put it back in, into the natural system is a, a huge task in a huge uh, way that we can preserve ongoing water supply. Pivoting over to uh, supply chain and materials management. Um, for those of you that have never been to a landfill, I recommend you to, and hopefully we'll start back up tours early next year. We've canceled all of our tools because of COVID-19 and uh, short staff, but uh, we'll be opening up tours again. Currently, we have a virtual tour online if you're interested. You can type in OCFL uh, landfill virtual tour and you can watch. It's like a 10 minute really cool video on the landfill tour. So I encourage everyone to do that. But Carrie, happy to have a group of students out there once we uh, get back up and running. And that same offers for the water treatment facility too. We'd be happy to have uh, students that uh, we do tours out our water treatment facility. Uh, but we've got a lot of goals in the region. Uh, the city of Orlando specifically has a zero waste goal, zero waste vision. Our goal here is to try to do as much as diver diversion and prevention of landfill waste as possible. Because of course, all of that is very expensive for us to manage and maintain and just leave it in the ground, uh, which causes a lot of emissions, runoff, et cetera, um, with regards to uh, maintaining and managing a landfill. So I encourage you all to, uh, everyone might have seen like reduce, reuse, recycle, which are like the three R's of recycling. But just as a quick reminder for everyone, I encourage you to think about that reduction because that is the greatest opportunity that we can do as individuals is kind of reduce, refuse some of the waste that we have and double think, well, do we really need this uh, styrofoam pack that can't be recycled? Or do we really need all this stuff? Um, that, we, uh, that we're just going to throw away into the landfill. So uh, that's one thing that I know it's a hard thing to, for us to, to do uh, sometimes and very personal, but it's actually very impactful because the less we're putting into the system, the less we have to figure out what to do with all that stuff. Um, and, and on that note too, recycling is very challenging and has become very challenging across the entire world. Uh, where you know we would always say, oh, well, I'm just going to drink this water bottle. It's going to be recycled anyway. It's become very difficult, very expensive, and very challenging to recycle these materials. Um, so again, as much as we can do on the prevention side and mitigation side is the better uh, focus on that. And I didn't even talk about composting on that one, but we do have some food waste initiatives across the uh, county and the city on uh, helping you reduce and divert food waste as well as prevent food spoilage and you know, getting food to where it needs to go across the system. Um, for those of you that are in working in apartments or homes, I recommend you visit centralfloridarecycles.net um, and that'll kind of map you exactly where you should go um, to recycle things and how do you recycle in your certain area. 
this is kind of agnostic for anywhere you live within Orange County, whether it's in a city or not. Um, we all have different uh, things, but at least the, the main things I can uh, remember and for you to remember is, you know, when in doubt, just throw it out. If you don't know if something is recycled uh, or being able to recycle or not, because the contamination, as I mentioned, uh, really affects our recycling stream and becomes more and more difficult every day to uh, divert and really recycle. On a trees and lands perspective, uh, this is the last section that I've got, and then I'll kick it over to Chris. Um, you know, here in Central Florida, we are so fortunate, and that's largely the reason why I ended up moving here from South Florida, was because we have these trees and we have these lakes and rivers and hiking trails and stuff that I never grew up with having. And it's an amazing asset that we have here, and uh, we need to figure out the best ways to preserve those assets and. Uh, even just a, on stuff that we manage directly at, at the county, uh, we have uh, about 106 parks out there across the county. Uh, we have uh, equestrian trails, we have campgrounds. Uh, for those of you that may not know, we have uh, actually the city manages one campground and uh, the county has three campgrounds out there, super cool. Um, and we're actually creating a new ecotourism center over in Lake Apopka, uh, which will be a nice uh, beautiful center next to the uh, pier there, as well as adjacent to the campground. But we have, uh, happy to report that we have been very dedicated to, uh, especially Mayor Demings uh, himself has been very dedicated to preserving an additional 23,000 acres of environmentally sensitive lands. It was actually one of his commitments when he took office uh, here, as well as uh, bringing a position like mine on board as well, um, but we have uh, started hacking at this goal. Of, we already have 24,000 acres in uh, possession and, and they're preserved lands, but we're looking to double that by 2030. So got a lot of work to do. Uh, we're on our way. We actually just per, uh, purchased the first property as part of that dedicated funding uh, just three weeks ago. So it's a super exciting work that we have uh, ongoing on the environmental preservation side. Um, but of course, a lot of these things require, it's a two-way street for you all that live out in the community. We encourage you to get outside. Uh, we encourage you to plant trees. We have uh, a variety of tree planting programs from the One Person, One Tree program. We have tree giveaways. Um, get outside on some of the parks that we have. You can uh, Google OCFL Green Place uh, and Preserves and Parks. And you'll see kind of like the regional map as to where the closest natural areas are for you. Um, and we also, if you're interested on horticulture um, and trees and landscaping and so on, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Orange County IFAS. It's down at the uh, left-hand corner there, IFAS, I-F-A-S. If you're interested in uh, any of these industries and sciences, uh, they have a ton of cool classes and certifications that you can get. As, uh, as students, uh, most of them are free or at a very low cost, five, $10. Uh, we offer a composting class, we offer a beekeeping class, rain barrel class, tree plantings, Florida friendly landscaping, pesticide, a ton of stuff that we have uh, at IFAS as a great regional asset for us. So my last thing that I'll talk through, um, and uh, I'm gonna kick it to uh, Chris after this, is we want your feedback with the Vision 2050. And what this is, is um, the Orange County is currently working on a comprehensive growth plan uh, that really will lay out the future of our community. And we want your feedback as to what you wanna see your future community uh, living here uh, in the future. So this, this vision is what we're crafting right now so that we can create codes and policies and uh, plans to go ahead and keep building out that future. You can check it out on the website, ocfl.net slash vision 2050. There's a short survey on there that you can partake in, but we really appreciate your feedback um, on this. And we'll probably reach out to Carrie on a deeper engagement with the students. We actually did something like that with UCF um, and a few different professors uh, earlier this year. So probably reach back out to Carrie on that. But again, this is looking at that future growth is what I said, uh, where these targeted growth areas, where we wanna densify, how the, the, 
real, the, the, the community will change quite a bit uh, across the county. Um, things were gonna go up uh, as, as well as uh, larger. So a lot of that is going to change over the next uh, 30 years. And we want you obviously to be part of it so that we can direct, you all can direct. Uh, again, this is a two way street. You are the local government as well. Uh, it's not just us here making decisions. You are enabled and empowered to make decisions as well. Uh, even at, and at, as long as you're 18 and over. Um, so the last thing I had for you was where are you going? Um, and I wanted to provide you just kind of my insight as to what I would recommend for you to do as emerging professionals is, uh, first of all, you all get a sticker for being here um, because being here is step one and learning about this uh, emerging field uh, of sustainability has really only been around for 15 years. So it's a very young field. Um, so I encourage you all to please get involved either on campus or in the community. All these uh, associations that I listed here have student groups, student memberships. Uh, we're just about to launch an ASHRAE chapter at Valencia. It's only $25 a year. And ASHRAE has committed to sponsoring the group, first group of students uh, on there. So that's an amazing opportunity. If you wanna get down and dirty, Ideas for Us is the place to be. Um, both Chris and I serve as board, uh, board members there and Chris is a co-founder of Ideas for Us there. And um, last things I'll say is seek sustainability internships in the field. There are so many internship opportunities, even just between Chris and myself, we've got a bunch of internship opportunities. And that's not, that's just us. Like aside from us, there's tons of other internship opportunities. And uh, I guarantee you, if you have a company that you're interested in working in, and if you call them up and say, hey, are you interested? Or I'd like to explore sustainability. Can I, can I come help you guys out? I'm sure they will gladly take you, especially because now everybody is trying to navigate and aggressively accelerate their sustainability projects. And Carrie, I'm sure, will gladly take you uh, with the sustainability office as well um, on campus to get engaged. Uh, for those of you that aren't on LinkedIn, please get on LinkedIn and create a uh, professional profile. That's kind of my number one thing, especially anyone that applies here at any level, internship or professional. I always check their LinkedIn profile first to see if they're even alive uh, and if they're actually a real person. <laughs> so uh, I always use that as a good checkpoint. Um, the last thing that really helped me personally when I was in school is I went ahead and seeked uh, credentials um, to augment uh, my schooling and my interests. So I went ahead and kind of took it upon myself and said, hey, you know, this stuff is really interesting. I'm going to go ahead and seek uh, credentials and certifications that I can put behind my name and show that I'm committed and that I know what this stuff means and how to actually practice it. So there's a lot of uh, availabilities for those credentials out there. I just listed a few of those, but a lot, many credentials have very early stage credentials and then mid-level and then professional credentials as you uh, continue to move on. So I'll also drop in the chat this cool new uh, website that was just uh, launched with uh, the US Green Building Council, which is a cool little navigator. If you're interested in building and construction on some of the stuff that we were talking about buildings and um, infrastructure. If you're interested in that side of things, uh, there's a cool little tool that will navigate you to how do you be, how do you become an architect, an engineer, an energy modeler, a green building reader, all these great things that, uh, you know, we do here. Um, so it kind of helps you navigate that. So with that, I will go ahead and uh, I thought I was going first or last. So that's why I tailed, tailed end there uh, to close out the, uh, the presentation. But uh, Chris, uh, is going to enlighten us on some of the great energy efficiency and building projects that are going across the county uh, right now. So Chris, to you. Excellent job, Jeff. Thank you so much. And, and um, it's really refreshing to have somebody like Jeff in the county now, just further bolstering the work that we've been all doing at the local level. And it's been such a, a pleasure to work with you, man. It's we're doing a lot together already. The city and the county are partnering on grants. We have programs that we're co-funding. Uh, we're doing, we're, we're really, I think, 
we've never had kind of a stronger relationship, especially as it relates to advancing our sustainability work. So um, yeah, it's been awesome and look forward to keeping that up with you. Um, just a little background again, my name is Chris Castro. I serve here at the city of Orlando and I've been here uh, for about seven and a half years helping to lead our sustainability and our resiliency work. And uh, today I wanted to share a little bit more about our, uh, our background, our kind of our humble upbringings and, th and then also a focus on our climate strategy. There's a lot of attention right now on the climate crisis and, and what cities can do, how cities can address this issue. And uh, hopefully I'll demystify some of that for you as I move forward. So as a little background, um, you know, Orlando started this work back in 2007 when our current mayor, Buddy Dyer, launched a Greenworks Orlando. And this was at a time when you know, Mayor was early on in his administration and really trying to figure out what are the things that we needed to prioritize and focus on to make Orlando the world-class city that all of us are trying to strive for, to make it the best place to live, to work, to learn, to play, uh, and, and for us to attract the creative class and future high wage job growth. Uh, and part of that came out with needing to focus on sustainability. We need to do more at being more environmentally friendly in our developments. We need to do a better job at being more socially equitable and inclusive. And we have to position our cities and our communities for you know, what's coming very, very quickly. And, and that is the green economy and the clean energy economy. Uh, as mayor often says, we don't have any cold jobs uh, here in the city of Orlando and we never will, but we can be at the forefront of fostering the growth of this new economy, this, this clean economy that we're moving towards. So Greenworks was born and over time, it has actually evolved into a full-fledged office of sustainability and resilience. Now it's permanently part of the organizational structure of our city beyond Mayor Dyer's term. This is, is something that we are gonna continue to move forward with as a priority. And we act as kind of this in-house consulting firm. A lot of the work that Jeff and I have done in our prior lives have been helping private sector, public sector academia as consultants think about sustainability and incorporate that and, and um, identify projects that, that really align with those goals. And so the beautiful thing about this work in Greenworks is we've become that for the city of Orlando. I work across, my, me and my team work across the entire organization from working with our chief of police and chief of fire to the head of streets and stormwater to planning and permitting, and then looking externally to our partners like Valencia and UCF and our utilities, our airport, our academic uh, uh, partners like OCPS. So uh, we're here to support the entire community in moving us in a cleaner and a healthier and more environmentally friendly direction. And the way that we do that has been focused on these seven areas of urban sustainability. You see those at the bottom left there, and I'm going to touch on three of them because Jeff did a great job talking about the strategies for, for um, you know, our, land, our natural lands, our water, our waste. And so I thought I'd um, also shed light on some of these other areas. Before we do, I, I do want to also recognize the importance of this, the sustainable development goals. I know Valencia has done an incredible job at infusing the SDGs in the curriculum. I've actually spoken at a number of your freshman conferences as they're coming on board uh, to becoming students of Valencia, SDGs are a focus and students pick a different goal and they try to go deep into developing projects or a capstone in the future. I think it's amazing and it's a model for colleges and universities across the country to take this global framework of sustainability and incorporate it at the local level so that we can continue to advance those goals. I'm, I'm proud to say that, uh, and, and I'll get to that here soon. So keep a lookout for the SDGs as you get into your career. These are going to be more and more um, critical for uh, businesses, for really all forms uh, of, of institutions. I wanna also recognize that Greenworks has grown pretty substantially. I came in here at the city um, really as, as just a, a couple, one of a couple people working on sustainability. And today we have this office of about a dozen staff that are working every day on advancing internal and external initiatives. And part of that, those initiatives are really um, co-created with our community. Uh, you know, the strategies that are in the Greenworks Community Action Plan were developed literally by residents and businesses in terms of, you know, what priorities they felt we needed to work on to advance Orlando towards this vision. So this is just a snapshot of some of the most recent plans we've created uh, the top left being our internal operations plan, the top right being our community-wide sustainability plan. 
Uh, and then at the bottom right, I wanted to spotlight that just two weeks ago, the city of Orlando published this voluntary local review, which is an official report to the United Nations on how we at the city level are advancing these global goals and really spotlighting some of the partnerships that have been established to do so. So I encourage you to check those out that can be found on our website uh, and, uh, and it'll, it'll really um, uncover some, some cool things that we're doing. So that's a background on, on some on, on green work so that you all understand uh, what the city is doing and how we're organized and you know, the governance model, so to speak. Now I wanted to pivot to talk more about you know, what we're doing to address climate climate change and this crisis that we're in. And as we all know, we can't effectively manage any issue without, without uh, measuring uh, where we are. And part of a city's understanding of how we contribute to the climate crisis is, is performing uh, a carbon accounting uh, exercise called the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory. This inventory brings together all of the data sets that contributes to carbon emissions uh, and other greenhouse gases in the city of Orlando. We look at obviously on-road vehicles and the gasoline and diesel that is consumed and the emissions from that. We look at the electricity generated uh, that's powering our buildings and our homes, right? And the emissions associated with those, with that power. We also look at upstream and downstream emissions from manufacturing of products to uh, the emissions of that particular product that, that are you know, contributing to the problem. So these are the different scopes of emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three. And over, over time in Orlando, we've been tracking our emissions, like where are our emissions coming from and how many? Since 2007, when we launched Greenworks, we started this annual process. And as you can see here, there's a couple of interesting stats. One is that we're seeing a positive trend in the right direction. Since 2007 to 2019, we've seen a 19% reduction in carbon emissions, all while we've grown the economy at a 2 to 3% clip per year. So we've grown the economy 20, 30% where we were, but we've seen a reduction in our emissions by about 20%. And what that's telling us is we are starting to decouple economic growth with emissions, at, with carbon intensity, right? That's a good thing. That's, that's the big question mark that governments around the world have been asking themselves. Can we actually keep growing our economy, keep developing new jobs and prosperity, almost with this mindset of an infinite resource planet, which we don't have, right? And at the same time, address climate change. And, and that's the question. So we are seeing reductions. Uh, and, and also I said 19%, that's total. When you look at per capita, we've actually seen a 36% reduction per person, per capita. So it's, it's, it's a good trend. Is it enough? No, we're, at, we're seeing a 2%, 3% reduction per year. We need to be at a five to 7% reduction per year to actually hit our goals, right? Now, where are the emissions coming from? You can see in the pie chart there that commercial energy use and residential energy use are the two biggest contributors to the problem. When you combine those two, it's really buildings, right? Buildings contribute to about 72% of Orlando's carbon footprint. The yellow wedge is that on-road transportation. That's about 27% of our emissions profile. And others are fugitive emissions, the emissions of our waste, the emissions of upstream emissions or upstream uh, products and services that the city controls. So, so we're, you know, trying to figure out, well, how does Orlando compare to the entire United States from a carbon emission standpoint? And when you look at the US, this is a, a chart that's developed by Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and it helps to identify where the biggest carbon emissions are coming from in the United States. You can see that the sources of energy are on the left-hand side, right? Petroleum, coal, natural gas, the renewables, and then you could follow where those uh, where those energy sources go to powering our economy and, and you know, how many uh, emissions are associated with those sectors. And so you can see that transportation across the country has now become the number one emitter. Uh, power generation used to be number one and it has slowly started to uh, drop in emissions intensity because the market has pivoted from using coal to using natural gas. That, that pivot because of fracking and hydraulic fracturing that we saw in, in you know, 2007, 8, 9, right when it was taken off, has really um, contributed to a natural market shift uh, towards a cleaner source of energy, although it's still, it's still dirty, right? So transportation is a big one, buildings are a big one, and electricity supply. Th these are the top three emitters for the nation. And so as a result, cities around the country are starting to say, we need to unify how we address 
the climate crisis in our cities across the country. And uh, Orlando was fortunate to be selected as a winner for the American Cities Climate Challenge. This was a challenge to the 100 largest cities around the country to develop a framework of policies and programs to drastically reduce emissions. And our proposal, our framework was a winning proposal. We were one of 25 that were selected. And over the last two and a half years, we've been getting funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies and other partners to deepen this work, to go really far on emissions reductions. And when it comes down to it, these four buckets are how cities across the country are going to really take a big whack at emissions. The first one is reducing building energy use. We have to drive more efficiency at our homes and our buildings because we're wasting a lot of the energy, this dirty energy that we're using, and it's the best and most cost-effective way to, to move the needle. Secondly, we have to increase renewable energy and drastically decarbonize the power supply. And we'll get into how we're doing that. Thirdly, we have to reduce vehicle miles traveled. This problem cannot be solved with every person being in their own private electric vehicle as we move forward. We have to think about transportation alternatives. That's a difficult thing in our region because we've built the city and the region of, around a car, but there are technologies that are allowing us to, to, to leapfrog. And then lastly, electrify everything. Our buildings that are being built, our vehicles that are you know um, starting to roll out, we need to focus on being focused on electricity. So I wanted to dive in here, uh, you know, for another 15 minutes or so to, to, to share examples of policies and programs that we're moving. That, that, that way you can really understand this further. So green buildings. Uh, first and foremost, the city is always touting the fact that we need to lead by example. Before we ask our residents or our business community to do something, you better believe that the city is stepping up to prove out why this is important. And one of the ways we've proven that is that every new city building that we build must achieve a high level of green building certification. You've probably heard of the LEED certification, right? That Jeff talked about with USGBC. Well, LEED certification is our, our green building standard that we strive towards. And in fact, we just moved the yardstick to lead silver as our minimum for every project. Every building you see on this, on this uh, screen here are all lead silver and lead gold facilities from the soccer stadium, the police stations, headquarters, uh, Amway Center, you name it. So that's important. We need to keep, keep pushing the needle, but it's not enough to build new buildings to be green and leave old buildings to be inefficient. And so we've done a, another priority has been to go back and retrofit and drive more energy efficiency in the outdated facilities. A big success story has been our work with the Better Buildings Challenge, which is the part of the US Department of Energy. Um, and what we did was to, to go back and retrofit our buildings, we did something really innovative. And that was we self-performed an energy savings performance contract, basically self-perform retrofits as a city. Uh, we passed a, basically a $17.5 million green bond uh, our, our fleet facilities team led by Ian Lahiff, another Valencia uh, champion, uh, went into and actually started retrofitting uh, some of uh, 56 of these buildings. And now what we've realized is over the last four years, we've now seen a reduction of 23% across our entire portfolio. So just targeting 56 buildings actually dropped about a quarter of the entire city's uh, consumption of energy in our city buildings. That is unbelievable. In addition, we've saved about $2.4 million per year compared to what we were spending before the retrofits. And so what we're doing is we're taking the savings and we're paying the debt on the bond plus the interest on that bond. And we're even seeing additional savings beyond that, uh, about 250,000 per year that we're able to recoup and put back into sustainability projects. So this is a prime example how um, sustainability is not just good for people and the planet, but also good for the pocketbook. And we need to continue to center the economic case, the business case. That brings me to policy. One of the ways that we've been looking at getting buildings to do more with energy efficiency is requiring that they start measuring themselves and, and their buildings in terms of their performance. You're, you're aware of miles per gallon uh, ratings, fuel economy ratings on cars, right? Well, what about buildings? When you go into a new apartment, or a new home to buy it, we don't necessarily know how efficient those homes are. And so sometimes people are getting into low cost housing, but they're realizing that they're being burdened by high cost utility bills. And, and so to address that, 
we now require, we have policy that requires every large building above 50,000 square feet to report, to, to benchmark and report their data to the city. And we make that publicly transparent. Uh, we did just publish uh, a week ago uh, a report for BWEST, an impact report that really talks about what the trends we're, we're realizing from this data. But it's amazing. And, and I think it's a big step into creating a market for energy efficiency. The other thing that we need to start to focus on is equity. And the fact is, is that uh, Hispanic, Black, uh, and other communities of color are disproportionately spending more on their utility bills in their neighborhoods than more affluent white communities. Uh, we know that there's disparities uh, of these demographics for housing, for transportation, for food insecurity, and yes, there's disparities with energy bills. And so this is a map that we've looked at in Orlando of what we call energy burden. Those that are spending more than the average for utility for household income that goes towards utilities. And in certain pockets, we're seeing two, three, sometimes four times as much people are spending in these lower income communities. And of course, they have less resources in the first place. So we need to start to target these areas and distribute resources to help them move towards sustainability quicker. And the one way that we've done that, or several ways, is we've developed different fi financing tools to help homeowners with offsetting the upfront cost to make these energy efficiency improvements and then using creative ways to pay back uh, th that cost over time, whether it's on the utility bill, whether it's on the property taxes or as a regular loan through self. So self, PACE and Efficiency Delivered are, are three great programs that we continue to foster. I'm excited that Jeff is bringing forward a commercial PACE ordinance for commercial buildings that will be able to use this tool as well, commercial and multifamily. So that's gonna be a big, big move for the region. And this isn't just good for, again, people in the planet, this is an economic development strategy. We've done over $18 million of investment in Orlando's market in a three-year period and about a thousand improvements to homes. This has created jobs, you know, major uh, gross economic output, like $45 million worth of gross economic output when you look at indirect and direct investment. A uh, lot, of, lot of stuff here. I'm gonna quickly pivot to our clean energy strategy now. So we've been talking about buildings, but what about uh, the second big priority and that's increasing renewable energy. Well, Orlando, you're probably aware, has a hometown utility, a municipal utility owned by the residents of the city. Now our utility is vertically integrated. We have power generation, we own the transmission and distribution lines, we own the meters, right? Vertically integrated. And uh, over, over the last hundred, almost hundred years, we've really invested like every other utility in fossil fuel assets. We have a lot, we still are running coal, we have natural gas, we're, we're, we're actually buying from Orange County landfill, we're buying gas so that we can you know, use landfill gas, and we have a growing portfolio of solar. And in, in 2017, Mayor Dyer and the city council actually brought forward an important policy that commits Orlando to moving to 100% renewable energy uh, future uh, for municipal operations by 2030, so nine years from now, uh, less than that, and, and uh, citywide by 2050. The challenge often is that cities are making these commitments, but they don't do a good job at engaging their utility to ensure that we're aligned with our strategic plans. I'm happy to say that that's that's something we have been doing a really good job with here in Orlando, working with OUC to not just pass policy at the city, but make that policy, uh, um, have that policy incorporated into the utility strategy. In December of 2020, just you know, uh, this past year, OUC unveiled their new strategic plan that looks out to 2050. And the big question was, are they aligned with the city? I'm happy to share that we are in lockstep with OUC. We've committed to net zero carbon by 2050 and intermediate CO2 reduction targets. So we're not waiting to the last year and then we're going to you know, somehow hit that goal. We have a 50% reduction in 2030 and 75% reduction in 2040. And then they committed to ending coal-fired generation in Orlando. This is probably the biggest climate win that we will have, single climate win that we will have in the history of Orlando is taking down the coal plants and moving away from that, the dirtiest source of energy on the planet. Um, and then as you can see in this trajectory, nothing but clean energy sources moving forward from 2030, 2040, 2050. How to go about doing that is a whole nother technical conundrum. 
right? Moving uh, hundreds of years of investment in fossil fuels to something in 30 years is one of the biggest technical feats humanity will ever face. And um, so we've been trying to engage all types of partners, NREL, National Labs, Google, Project Sunroof, we're in touch with GreenLink. And um, on, the, on the screen here, you see um, a cutting uh, of Orlando's market uh, for a tool that we've developed with Google to map every single rooftop in Orlando. We've mapped every rooftop for the solar potential. How much solar can we land on your home or on this commercial building? What the simple payback might be? And I'll tell you that there's a considerable amount of, of generation potential here, about two gigawatts, two gigawatts of rooftop solar just in the city limits. When you look at the county, it becomes probably double or triple that. Um, and so there's a lot of potential. And this next video will show you some rooftop solar installs that we've now started to roll out from this analysis. So here you're looking at um, our fire stations. When we talked to mayor, we asked him, what facilities should we focus on for rooftop solar? And he said, critical buildings. We need emergency operations center. We need the 911 call station. We need a fire station. We need our neighborhood center. So um, that was, during COVID, all four of those facilities actually were installed. Um, this is a snapshot of our fleet and facilities complex, another critical uh, facility of, of the city. And uh, we've already had solar on this roof for some time, but we're about to uh, build this carport canopy that will also shade our vehicles. So we're getting creative about using solar to, to, to act as canopies over parking lots. Um, we're, we're, we're partnering, this is an example of partnering with Jeff, we're partnering with the county on hosting these solar co-ops. Every year, the city and the county pool our funds together and we host these group buying programs. They're basically allowing residents to get better price points for solar through economies of scale, right? If 200 people go solar together versus one person, of course, you can achieve better economies of scale with bulk purchasing. So we've done uh, in Orlando hundreds of rooftop solar uh, installs for residents through this model and we've seen about a 10 to 15% reduction of the market price uh, by going through the co-op. And so every year we, we will anticipate hosting another co-op. Residents can sign up and uh, go through the process of getting solar on their roof. But one of the challenges we face is multifamily is becoming the name of the game for housing. We're trying to densify our communities and more people are living in apartments and condos. And so how do they get access to solar? How do we move those buildings to 100% renewables? And part of doing that are these larger community solar farms. These are um, uh, just two examples of solar farms that OUC and the city have brought on online over the last few years. Um, this most recent one that we're looking at just came on last summer. And look how expansive this is. I mean, this is about 300 acres of old cattle ranch land that was slated for more development, more sprawled development in Central Florida, and instead said, we need to acquire this, maintain that land, and be able to turn it into a solar farm. The beauty about these programs is everyone from Valencia College to you in an apartment on the third floor of this apartment complex or a single family home, everybody has access to these solar farms to basically subscribe your power to come from those solar farms. So in Orlando, we have a choice. We can get green power, 100% renewables, or we can get fossil fuel power, but we have a choice. If you're an OUC customer, you can choose. Also Duke Energy has a program now where you can choose. So uh, Orlando's stepped up to ensure that we're subscribing a lot of our buildings, things like City Hall, 17 fire stations. And just recently we added 12 park, uh, uh, 21 parks like Lake Eola and 12 neighborhood and senior centers that are all now being powered off of these solar farms. Um, and I will say that one of the exciting applications for solar is this concept called photovoltaics or floating solar. We have all these retention ponds. Jeff talked about looking like Swiss cheese from the air, right? Those are man-made water bodies. They have the ability of being floating and start floating solar on these. And Orlando has become a national test site for NREL to actually scale floating solar. And so we have about a megawatt, over a megawatt of floating solar installed. This one here is at the airport as an example in the shape of the Orlando logo. You know, as you go off to that new terminal, Terminal C, you'll see more floating solar being put in and around the airport and, and beyond. So a lot of cool stuff there. Lastly, on energy, we can't transition to 100% renewables unless we solve the energy storage uh, problem. 
right now, these sources are intermittent, right? They, they don't produce 24 seven, 365. They're only producing when the sun is out as it relates to solar. And so we got to think about new technologies. Well, OUC uh, is leading the charge on piloting green hydrogen uh, and actually combining not just green hydrogen, but other storage technologies like lithium ion batteries, you've probably heard of those, and what we call VRF, vanadium redox flow batteries. That's another type of energy storage. So this is a, an example of what OUC is now testing where they have floating solar, it's powering a hydrogen electrolyzer, making green hydrogen, storing that hydrogen. And then as cloud cover starts to come over, they are gonna true up and use smart controllers to use the stored hydrogen to meet the load that's lost by solar through that intermittency, right? So then you can make solar a dispatchable resource. Utilities can actually rely now on solar as a resource versus now it's not looked at as, as that because of its intermittency. Uh, so a lot of stuff happening with clean energy, very exciting. I know that we're running close on time here. So I'm gonna quickly run through transportation and just say, we're doing a lot with alternative uh, transportation. Like I said, we have to reduce VMTs. So here's a, a whole slew of different forms of mobility that we've tried to enable. Um, you know, urban trails, the limo BRT, SunRail, we even have autonomous electric shuttles that are operating in Lake Nona now, eight shuttles moving people back and forth from the town center to their homes. It's a point to point solution. And it's a really interesting strategy for urban villages as we start to scale around Central Florida. Um, Micromobility is a big deal. You know, and so we're happy to have enabled electric scooters and bikes throughout the city. And I know the county is now looking forward to launching their pilot with e-mobility. Uh, and so that's gonna be critical. But what's, what, what's on everybody's mind with transportation is electric vehicles. And it's, it's no surprise now that pretty much every automaker on the planet is racing towards EVs. They're not just coming out with one or two models. They are literally coming out saying we're ending internal combustion engine vehicles, and we are solely going to be producing electric vehicles within the next 10 to 15 years. That is like right around the corner in the, in the time frame that the government works, right? And so we need to start to really get ahead of this curve. We've been projecting that Orlando is going to see a doubling of electric vehicles on the road by 2025. We have about 5,500 EVs currently. We had 4,200 EVs at the end of December. So we've grown uh, you know, substantially about 30% just in this year. Uh, and what we're seeing is that we'll have closer to 12,000 vehicles on the road by 2025. And then this is a disruptive technology. It's not a linear curve. This, if you look at disruptive technologies, these things take off like a rocket. And projections are saying that by 2030, we might see up to 30% of registered new vehicles being electric. It might even be more. So we've been trying to figure out, well, how do cities create an environment that welcomes EVs? And there's different things that we have to do. Like I did with buildings, city vehicles and our fleet needs to lead by example. We've made a commitment that 100% of our fleet is gonna to move towards electric and alternative fuel by 2030. We also are working on building out charging infrastructure. So here's a little map of Central Florida. You can see that there's a huge density of chargers in, in Orlando's market. And we just worked with OUC to add another hundred of these chargers around the city. These are targeting parks, neighborhood centers, parking garages in downtown. We're really trying to make it easier for people to get into their electric and be able to have uh, a charging, uh, ubiquitous charging around. And, and I'm really excited that uh, early next year, we will be unveiling one of America's largest uh, e-mobility hubs, these recharge hubs. These are gonna be the gas stations of the future, essentially. They can charge your car between 15 and 30 minutes to 100%. And so you can literally park here, go across the street, go to the restroom, get a cup of coffee. By the time you're done, you're getting in your car and you keep going down on the road, right? And so that's the idea is we're gonna move very quickly uh, and it's not just personal vehicles, goods delivery, right? Amazon, UPS, FedEx, they're all committing to 100% electric. Uber and Lyft, rideshare will be 100% electric by 2030. I mean, these are huge disruptions in the market that, that I don't think people are really, really paying attention to as much as we should. Uh, and that's our role. That's what Jeff and I need to elevate for our leadership, right? Uh, and so lastly, I'll say is that we're working on buses, right? School buses and transit buses are some of the the best opportunities to transition to electric for a number of reasons. 
And so we, we're excited that we now have eight electric buses operating in Orlando. We have another six in manufacturing that will be landing here and be operational by next summer. And uh, here's a, just a quick short video of the unveiling of it as we, as we launched, um, we launched this in October. You'll see these wrap pretty creatively. This one is in a big, it looks like a big battery moving down the road, which I love. Um, and it's just fascinating. Not only is it quiet, but it's really clean, right? And transit buses are the notorious polluters uh, that impact public health and the environment. So super stoked about that. A lot of what I mentioned here, by the way, um, was, has actually been spotlighted in a National Geographic documentary that I really invite you all to check out. It's called Paris to Pittsburgh. And it really spotlights Orlando as one of these vanguard cities that are moving forward with climate action. Uh, and so with that, we'll turn it back over to Carrie and, and Lisa and the team and happy to enter into Q&A. Thank you. We'll go ahead and uh, take the questions first. If, if anybody has any, a couple minutes for that. I know that was a lot of information, both from Jeff and I. It was kind of like a fire hose, drinking from a fire hose, right? So um, we're happy to share these slides in PDF form and, and so you guys can digest them a little bit more after the summit. EMCT, okay, so we had a question. What's EMCT? Yes, Lisa just put that in there. It's actually a degree that um, Valencia College has called Energy Management and Controls Technology. And it's a really great, uh, and that's what Jeff is a professor for. What exactly is the Virgin Bright Line train? Apparently it's coming up in a couple of years from now. Yeah, great question. So um, Florida for a long time has been looking at high-speed rail and we had an opportunity a little, you know, about a decade plus ago and we lost that opportunity. Uh, but I'm happy to share that uh, Virgin has acquired a company called Brightline that has been building the first high-speed rail in the state of Florida. It's already operating between West Palm and Miami. And now the spur is being built on 528. If anybody's been on the beach line, B line right, going out to Coco, you'll see there's a lot of development on that south side as you go out to Coco, right? Uh, well, that's, that's basically the new high-speed rail line that's gonna be connecting South Florida to Orlando. And they actually have plans to go from Orlando over to Tampa. So it'll be our first high-speed rail. The cool thing is it's a fully private funded train. So actually no public dollars going, going into it. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, I think it's gonna be a big part of connecting us better to South Florida and hopefully taking cars off the road. So we got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, one is who would be responsible for the usage charge for the EVs and charging stations, which are not at individual homes? Well, uh, just like everybody is in charge of paying their own gasoline at a gas station, uh, you would be in charge of, of essentially paying for the electricity from these charging stations. Uh, we do have a short term window in this first year of the public chargers that I mentioned that are free as an incentive to get people to get into those EVs. So if you're using those, you'll see that they, they are free. There's an app that you would need to download. It's called Green Lots. And Green Lots has the whole map of where those chargers are. And, and you can just go to one of those chargers, open it up from your phone and be able to use it. Um, uh, but basically you as the driver are, are supposed to be charging. Now, when you look at the price of gasoline, which only continues to go up as we're seeing, and you look at the price of electricity, which is a lot more stable and has been historically, the equivalent gallon price is about a dollar per gallon when you're using electricity. And right now at the pump, it's over three bucks, right? So it's a third of the cost, even if you're paying it on your own, to, to operate an EV versus operating a gasoline car. That doesn't even count for the maintenance and other operational savings that you get from EVs. So a uh, really good use, you know, business case for getting into electric vehicles these days. Chris and Jeff, another question is, any special program for disposing of roofing discards? Jeff, what do you think on that one? You're talking about like wood Shingles? shingle and a bunch of stuff you're referring to, I assume. I think so. 
Yeah, so uh, it's actually a huge opportunity for us here. We currently don't have a construction demolition recycling facility here. And with the amount of growth that we have, it would make sense for us to have something at the landfill that could process a lot of that material, wood, metals, concrete, all those things are uh, very well recycled in the construction industry. So we don't have anything as far as specific disposal for uh, shingle products for wood products. Yes, we do have recycling available for wood products, um, of course. And um, what else was I going to add on that? Uh, as far as any unused items or still usable items, I would encourage you to donate those items. Uh, there's an organization called Rebuilding Together, as well as Habitat for Humanity, that will be glad to take some of that excess roofing material. Um, so that we can go ahead and put those and reapply those on underserved uh, homes and low income uh, homes. Tire disposal, another one, we do have a tire disposal program that's actually a regulated entity through the state. Um, there's several local recyclers for tires, um, but you can, you can either drop those off at one of those recyclers or at the landfill, we'll take them uh, and make sure that they get to the right place because all that is absolutely recycled and um, You've probably all seen some of the recycled mulch out there that is used in other types of uh, ground courts for parks and so on. One of the things I didn't get to share is some of our zero waste initiatives for, for residents uh, here in Orlando. We have a composter program for residents. So anybody living in city limits uh, that wants to start re-earthing and, and diverting your food waste from the landfill, we provide a free composter for, for every resident, not only do we assemble it, but we deliver it to your door. And so we're really encouraging people to, to compost. If you don't have a backyard or a place to put a composter, we also have public drop-off locations for food waste at farmer's markets, both at Lake Eola Market and Audubon Park Market. We're gonna start to scale to some of these other markets coming up too. Uh, and, and, so, and then there's public drop-offs, Dover Shores on the east side and on the west side um, over by our Fleet and Facilities Operations Center. So you can literally come there at an evening and dump in your food waste into that container. We take it to be properly diverted and composted. Uh, and, and then lastly is on, on grease and textiles and, uh, and, and uh, electronics. Um, we, we host a number of events throughout the year where residents can come out free of charge to dispose of those things. So if you have some old cell phones or old you know, TVs or whatever, keep them and keep a lookout for the next round. Um, I think our next one will be in February when we will, you know, open up the ability for people to come out and dispose of those at no cost to you. Yeah, and just so you know, you know, like Chris said, we always do like those um, one time events throughout the year, um, whether it's textiles or electronics and stuff, we always do those events that come to you closer to the neighborhoods, but you can always go to the landfill and I dropped the link to the chat. There's a household uh, drop off site so that if you just have stuff that you need to drop off that uh, can be recycled or has some of those things, textiles, recycling, all that, uh, electronics, et cetera. We'll take all that stuff year round. Um, the landfill is open uh, for that. I did want to, there was another question that talked about um, the rain barrel program. We do have a rain barrel program. It depends on your utility. So OUC has a rain barrel program, as well as if you're just an Orange County resident and Orange County Utilities water customer, you do have access to the rain barrel program as well. Um, I'll drop the link to both of those programs. Again, it just depends on who's your water provider on those. There's a lot of questions coming in about how to stay connected and updated about these things. I'm putting a link in the chat to sign up for our Greenworks newsletter. Um, this comes out on a quarterly basis, and we try to fill in all of the upcoming events and opportunities to get plugged in, as well as just general updates about what uh, what we're doing and how we're advancing the mission. So definitely encourage you to sign up there. Yeah, and we are just about out of time. So I want to do the closing. And then I guess if our presenters have extra time and want to stick around and answer more questions, that would be okay. But we need to, um, you know, close down kind of on time. So um, Jeff and Chris, thank you so much. This is the part of the presentation where if we were in the same room, you'd have a thunderous round of applause because that was an amazing session. I know I have pages and pages of notes on my remarkable e-tablet here. Um, hmm. So really excited uh, that I got to see this today. 
Uh, I do want to let our, our um, participants know that we are the conference is not over. We still have several sessions remaining this evening and tomorrow. Uh, so be sure that you're plugged into what's coming up. Um, and again, just thank you so much. Uh, be sure to connect with the Office of Sustainability on social or via email. And after the conference, the session recordings will be on our YouTube channel, which uh, is a direct URL to is on the screen or will be momentarily when my PowerPoint catches up with me here. Oops, try that, there we go. Um, okay, so uh, there you can see the link for the conference recording. So please make a note of that. We'll leave this up for a couple of minutes. Thank you everyone for coming and have a great day. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. I may even tell my professor about this too, you know. Please do keep it yeah, up. Yeah, definitely. The best thing we can do is all elevate the conversation with family, friends, colleagues, professors. So keep keep yeah. the narrative going. I will. Bye, thank guys. you, Lisa. Thank, thank you, you, Carrie. Good job, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So, so <laughs> keep much. moving forward. Bye. Right. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks so much. Oh, let me stop this recording.